Alhamdulillah, we reached verses 13 and onwards and continuing our discussion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous verses spoke about a very important moment in the life of the Holy Prophet where he experiences the ultimate level of proximity to his Lord. The verses that we mentioned last week where we spoke about this idea of being two bow lengths in nearness to God, Fadana, Fatadalla, Fakana Qaba Qawseini al Adna, that moment represents the closest encounter between Allah Azza wa Jal and any of his created beings, any creation. So this is the closest that any makhluk has attained in nearness to his Lord. So this dana fatadalla fakana qaba qawseinu adna is the closest encounter between a created being and the creator. And the one who was honored with this qurb, with this proximity was the Holy Prophet. Now we mentioned in our last session that the majority opinion is that those verses were referencing the Prophet's vision of the angel Gabriel in his actual form. And then they may transition to say that this dana fatadalla fakana qaba qawseini wa adna is about his vision of God with the eye of the heart. But we mentioned that Ayatollah Sheikh Nasim Makarim al-Shirazi believes that the verses preceding this verse that come before these verses, they're all revolving around this idea of this inner witnessing that the Prophet experienced. Now in ayah number 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى Now the word nazla, you know, when we hear the word nazla, it's typically understood as a part of, as, as an the idea of descent. You know, inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. But here the word nazla means marratan thani, mar marratan ukhra. That he, and certainly he, the Holy Prophet, saw him with a capital H, meaning God, yet another time. Now again, there are many who believe that these two visions refer to the Prophet seeing Jibra'il in his actual form. However, you know, I believe, and you know, Sheikh Nasan Makarim al-Shirazi, I support you know, this opinion that this is referring to a shuhud al-Batini, the inner witnessing of God. Now, as I mentioned, nazlatan here means marratan, a second time the Prophet ﷺ is able to have this spiritual experience whereby the veils are lifted and he's able to witness God, the majesty of God, meaning that there's a type of disclosure that takes place in two places. The first was what we mentioned in our previous session, وَهُوَ بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى that the Prophet saw God through the eye of his heart at the highest part of the horizon. And then Allah is telling us about the second time where this hijab is removed, where he's able to see the majesty of God in a way that no other creation has witnessed. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى When did the second inner witnessing take place. So the first was, وَهُوَ بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى As we mentioned in the earlier verses. The first inner witnessing that the Prophet experienced was at the highest part of the horizon. Presumably, سَمَاءُ dunya, The highest point of this, this horizon. The second occasion, the second place where this inner witnessing takes place, the Qur'an says, عند سدرة المنتهى at the lot tree of the boundary. Now, if you look at the books of Tafasir, there are many 
opinions regarding the reality of this mysterious tree. Now, it's important for us to bear in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about a world that is beyond this physical world that we're familiar with. However, because he's speaking to us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala employs words that are relatable to us. So when we speak about this lot tree, I don't want you to mistakenly assume that Allah is talking about the trees that we're familiar with in dunya. You know, they have, you know, there's a, there's a tree trunk, there are branches, there are leaves. So even though these relatable words are being used, we have to understand that its reality is not, it's not like the trees that we're familiar with. So this second vision of God, this second divine disclosure takes place at the low tree of the boundary. Most of the commentators of the Quran have said that this is a tree in the seventh heaven. Now, I have to reiterate that when, when I say the seventh heaven, I don't want you to think that I'm talking about Jannah. Jannah is paradise. When I say heaven, I'm talking about Sama. When I say heavens, we're talking about Samawat. So the prophet experiences this vision of God, of his Lord, this inner witnessing at the tree, at the low tree of the boundary. Now, why does, number one, why is the word lot tree mentioned? There are many trees. Why does Allah describe this tree as being sidra, a lot tree? Now, if you look at lot trees on earth, they have certain characteristics, and I'll speak more about this. And I just want you to keep this in mind. A lot tree is a tree that has many, many leaves. You know, there are some trees that have very few leaves. The lot tree is known for its incredible abundance of leaves. It's also known for casting a very large shadow. You know, because of its sheer size. And it's also a tree, at least the earthly version of the tree, has many medicinal use, usages. Uses. So I just want, to, I want you to keep those facts about the lot tree in mind. And inshallah, I'll mention some of the characteristics of this, this mysterious tree that exists in the seventh heaven. Now, it is called Sidrat al-Muntaha because according to some, all that is created ends there. So you have Alam al-Khalq and this mysterious tree is in the seventh heaven. So beyond it, there, no created being has any knowledge of what is beyond it. It's almost seen as this lot tree represents the boundary of Alam al Khalq. It's the boundary of the world of creation. Beyond it, there is no creation, there is no created being. So it is called of the boundary, the lot tree of the boundary. This boundary is because. All that is created ends there so that none can pass beyond it, as we will see in a hadith from Imam al Baqar. None are able to pass beyond it, even the archangel Gabriel. And not, none know what lies beyond it. So it's one thing to say that I'm not allowed to go beyond this boundary, but you may know what is beyond the boundary. So creation ends there. No one has knowledge of what is beyond this boundary, not even other prophets. If you ask Ibrahim, السلام, what is beyond Sidrat al-Muntah? They don't know. Only the Prophet 
has both the theoretical and the existential understanding of what is beyond it because he went beyond the boundary now here i want to point your attention to a very important principle in spirituality you notice that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals himself there is a type of disclosure the hujub are being removed at certain places which means in spirituality there are certain places that are conducive for our spiritual growth meaning there are certain places where the soul is not distracted where the soul is ready and prepared and primed to witness the majesty of god for example if you look at the history of musa السلام, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the tawarat to musa where he tells him to go to mount sinai allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could reveal the tawarat anywhere why does musa have to go to a certain place it's because certain places have sanctity there are certain places that are considered you know spiritual magnetic fields where the soul is more prepared and more primed to receive wahi to witness certain spiritual realities now the heart which in Arabic is called the qalb, is called qalb because this because the heart changes. Our spirituality nat naturally fluctuates. Why does it fluctuate? And this is a characteristic of the heart. You know, it's called heart because it it, it, go, it goes through this, it undergoes change. This is why if you look at the munajat of Imam Zain al Abidin, the munajat are different. You know, the Imam has munajatul khaifin, the whisper prayers of the fearful ones, munajatul shakirin, munajatul ragibin. So the Imam is highlighting that the soul changes, the heart undergoes change. And sometimes this change happens because of certain circumstances. And sometimes this change happens because we're in certain places that are seen as spiritual magnetic fields. This is why when you're in Mecca, when you're in Hajj, you feel more spiritual. When you're in Najaf, when you're in Karbala, you feel more spiritual because your heart is like a metal. And Jannah and Nar, they are like magnets right they pull you towards themselves so on earth we have certain environments that are paradisal environments that are heavenly environments and we have other environments that are hell hellish environments so the more you put yourselves in the magnetic fields of dunya you become more dunyawi and the more you spend time in the places of spirituality and the places that are heavenly in their nature you develop that quality it becomes second nature to you so you see that the quran when it speaks about this experience of the prophet you find brothers and sisters that this this disclosure this encounter cannot happen in dunya because of the limitations of dunya the prophet experiences the optimal proximity when he leaves the realm of alam al dunya because the first vision takes place where the highest part of the horizon and the second witnessing, the second inner witnessing, 
because again, God cannot be seen with the physical eye, happens in the Sidrat al Muntaha. And it's almost as though, you know, we can, it may be, you know, I don't want to say this with full confidence, it may be that the underlying message is that the only way that you can see God with the eye of the heart, where you can experience this maximum closeness, is if you turn your attention away from alam with dunya. There's no way that you can be obsessed with dunya and be materialistic in your ways and also experience this shuhud batani, this internal witnessing. So Allah removes the Prophet from this low material physical existence and he takes him to the higher realms so he can witness God's majesty and his glory. And by the way, brothers and sisters, dunya represents the lowest level of existence. This is why Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi says, إِنَّمَا سُمِّيَتْ الدُّنْيَا دُنْيًا لِأَنَّهَا أَدْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, this worldly life, this earthly life has been called dunya because in Arabic, dunya means something that is low. Because it's lower than everything. It's the lowest realm. And therefore, when we refine our souls, we are able to elevate ourselves. And even though we are earthly creatures, we can refine our souls and we can become heavenly even when we are living on earth. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى So you see that there is an implicit reference to this idea of detaching from عَلَمُ dunya to experience this inner witnessing of God. And it's also an implicit reference to the idea that there are certain places that Allah loves. There are certain sacred spaces. It's better for you to go to the masjid to do your five daily prayers because the masjid is a place that has been deemed as the house of God on earth. There are certain places that you should frequent because it, enha it enhances your spirituality. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى And then Allah says in the next ayah, عِنْدَهَا جَنَّةُ الْمَأْوَى By which lies the garden of the refuge. So you have, so I want you to understand this almost in a hierarchical sense. So you have almost like a hierarchy. You have عَالَمُ dunya, سَمَاءُ dunya, And then you have the first Sama. And by the way, this universe that we see the observable universe represents sama al dunya. You know, Allah says in the Quran, "Walaqad zayyana sama al dunya bimasabih." We have decorated the earthly heaven, meaning one of the seven, the lowest one is sama al dunya. We have decorated it with lanterns, with stars, with planets. So you have alam al dunya. You have Sama'ud Dunya, and then you have the second heaven, the third, the fourth. And we don't we don't have access. We we don't have access to the second heaven. We don't even have access to part of Sama'ud Dunya. We're not able to go outside of our galaxy. We're not able to go outside of our solar system. Sama'ud dunya, then above it you have the second heaven, the third, the fourth. And we mentioned that the riwayat say Sidrat al Muntaha is at the limit of the seventh. And then this ayah says, there, beyond where, where you see Sidrat al Muntaha, this is where the garden of the refuge is. So some have understood that the eternal paradise is right there. 
at the limit where Sidrat al Muntaha is, this is where Jannah is. Jannah al Khund, according to some. Now, why does the Quran say Innaha Jannah al Ma'wa? The word Ma'wa, you know, it comes from the word, the verb Awa. You know, this is why Nabi Nuh alayhi salam, when he told his son to come on the ark, he says, What? Sa'awi ila jabalin. I will go and seek protection. I will seek refuge on top of the mountain. He uses the word awi, right? To seek refuge. So Jannah here is described as a place of refuge. Jannah is a place of refuge from pain, from suffering. It's protection from all things that are harmful. It's protection from Iblis, from the enemies of God. In dunya, we don't have that type of protection. Everyone is mixed. The mu'mineen are mixed with mujrimin. Shaytan, according to the ahadith, he runs in you like the blood runs through your veins. But paradise is the place of refuge, the place of protection. If you go to Surah as sajda Surah 32, Ayah number 19, Allah mentions the idea of paradise as being a place of refuge. As for those who believe and do good deeds. Because in Islam, it's not enough to say, I believe. You have to have amal salih. You have to have good deeds. فَلَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ الْمَأْوَى For those people, for the people who have iman, and they manifest their faith through good deeds, for them are the gardens of refuge. نُزُلًا بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ A special accommodation because of what they used to do. Now, some of the Mufassireen, they have said, Jannatul Ma'wa is not for everybody because Jannah, paradise, has degrees. Jannatul Ma'wa is a reference to the higher levels of paradise. It's the place where the souls of the prophets and the messengers reside and the shuhada. So this is a reference to the higher echelons of paradise, the higher degrees of paradise. This is, this is one opinion that's mentioned. So if we go back to the ayah, the prophet sees God through his heart, the vision of God at the low tree of the boundary. And at that boundary is the eternal garden, the garden of refuge. And then Allah in the next ayah describes something about this lot tree. When there covered the lot tree that which covered. Again, believe me brothers and sisters, without Ahlul Bayt, without the Ahadith, we would not understand what this verse is talking about because the ayah is not talking about what is covering the low tree. It's ambiguous. And this is why anyone who says Hasbuna Kitab Allah, that sufficient for us is the book of God, we say to them, What is the meaning of Idiyaksha How can you possibly understand what this verse means unless you refer to the Ma'sumin, unless you refer to the Holy Prophet? and those who inherited their knowledge from Rasulullah, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. There's a hadith from the Prophet where he says, he describes what he saw when he looked at this tree. And again, brothers and sisters, this is not like the trees that we are familiar with in dunya. The closest word that can help us understand what this thing is, is a lot tree. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, 
رأيت على كل ورقة من أرواقها ملكا قائما يسبح الله تعالى The Prophet he says when I looked at this tree I looked at every leaf on that tree and upon every leaf on this tree on this Sidrat al-Muntaha I saw an angel standing and doing tasbih the Prophet he says this tree is surrounded by malaika every leaf has an angel upon it doing tasbih it's really a very astonishing description and subhanallah look at the merit of tasbih this is the outer limit of creation this is the boundary of creation and allah says that this tree is covered with malaika doing tasbih you see brothers and sisters how important tasbih is that the prophet on mi'raj he reaches sidrat al-muntaha and the main activity of the malaika who are at this limit at this the furthest region of creation they're doing tasbih and then the holy prophet he says again in another hadith he speaks about sidrat al-muntaha he says intahaytu ila sidrat al-muntaha so the prophet he traverses the samawat and he reaches this tree sidrat al-muntaha the low tree وَإِذَا الْوَرَقَةُ مِنْهَا تَظِلُّ أُمَّةً مِنَ الْأُمَمِ The Prophet says every leaf, forget about the tree itself, every leaf can cast a shadow over an entire nation. Have you seen the, the leaves that are on the tree in this world? If you take a leaf, what kind of shadow can the leaf of dunya cast maybe a few cents a few inches the prophet says each leaf on that mysterious tree that i saw is so great so large that it can cast a shadow over an ummah over an entire nation there's a hadith from imam al-baqir salawatullahi alayhi and this hadith is recorded by Shaykh al Saduq. Shaykh al Saduq is one of our most prominent ulama who lived during the time of the early time of the the Ghayba, Ghayba al Sughra and Ghayba al Kubra. He narrates a hadith. He has a book called Ilal al Shara'ir, you know, the, the philosophy of some of the, the rulings some of the divine injunctions. He narrates a hadith from Imam al-Baqir where the Imam speaks about the Prophet reaching Sidrat al-Muntaha. Imam al-Baqir he mentions the ayah وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى He's speaking about these verses and then he's giving his commentary. Imam al Baqir he says, يعني عندما وافى به جبرائيل حين صعد إلى السماء. Jibrail was with the Prophet in Mecca and he escorted him, he transported him from Mecca. To Masjid al Aqsa. This is known as Isra, the night journey. And from Masjid al Aqsa, there was an ascension from one heaven to the next heaven, to the third, to the fourth. And Jibrail was with the Prophet in every stage of this journey. When they reached, Sidrat al-Muntaha waqafa Jibra'il. Jibra'il stood, stopped. Because Jibra'il is the, is the angelic tour guide of Mi'raj. 
when they reach the low tree, Jibra'il stops. Waqafa Jibra'il dunaha. Jibra'il stands beside this tree and he turns to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he says, Ya Muhammad. You know, it's interesting that Jibra'il doesn't call him Ya Rasulullah. It's, you know, sometimes when you speak to someone, you speak to them in a formal way, when it's a formal setting. But here, it's almost like it's a very, you know, endear, a very intimate conversation between Jibra'il and the Prophet. Ya Muhammad. So this is the greatest angel having a conversation with the greatest human being. Ya Muhammad, in hadha mawqifi. Because now the Prophet is not, this has nothing to do with his message on earth, right? This, so he's not assuming the role as Rasul. This is a different realm. This is a different, you know, function for the Prophet. Ya Muhammad, inna hadha mawqifi alladhi wadha'ani allahu fi. Oh Muhammad, this is my place. This is the limit that God has set for me. وَلَنْ أَقْدِرَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ أَتَقَدَّمَهُ I am not able, I will never be able, he uses the word len, I will never be able to go beyond this boundary, this Sidrat al-Muntah. وَلَكِنْ إِمْضِ أَنْتَ أَمَامَكَ إِلَى السِّدْرَ That, O oh Muhammad, however you, you go ahead, you go ahead, you have to go alone now. You are now stepping in to a realm that no angel has ever gone into. No prophet has ever stepped beyond this boundary. And then Imam al-Baqir, he says, so Imam al-Baqir is sharing the story and he's also commenting as he shares the story. Imam alayhi salam, he says, Summiyat Sidratul Muntaha لِأَنَّ أَعْمَالَ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ تَصْعَدُ بِهَا الْمَلَائِكَةُ الْحَفَظَةُ إِلَىٰ مَحَلِّ السِّدْرَةِ So here the Imam is talking about why it is called Sidratul الْمُنْتَى He says because the a'mal, the actions of all of the inhabitants of the earth are sent up. You know, your a'mal are... Our a'mal ascend. You know, we have the scribes on earth. The malaika, they record our deeds and our deeds are sent up. Why are they sent up? What is the purpose of it? We don't know. But there is an ascension with respect to our deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, when He speaks about good words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah number 10, Ayah number 10, he says, إِلَيْهِ يَصْعَدُ الْكَلِمُ الطَّيِّبِ To God ascends the good word. وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ يَرْفَعُ الْكَلِمُ الطَّيِّبِ Some have said it means Tawheed. To say, لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ This is الْكَلِمُ الطَّيِّبِ but to propel it, to make it go up, you need amal salih. So there's this idea of good deeds ascending. Imam al-Baqir says the good deeds of all people on earth are sent up by the angels to this point. Sidrat al-Munta. wal al-Kiram. So you have angels that take up these deeds. And then you have angels that receive these deeds at Sidratul Munta. فَيَنْتَهُونَ بِهَا إِلَىٰ مَحَلِّ السِّدْرَةِ The a'mal, whether they're good or evil, they are all taken up and they are stored at this boundary, Sidratul Munta. The Imam alayhi salam so, there, so there's a relationship between this tree 
and malaika and the preservation of deeds. The Imam then says, فَنَظَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَرَأَى أَغْصَانَهَا تَحْتَ الْعَرْشُ وَحَوْلَ The Prophet looks at this tree and he sees its branches under the throne of God. Now again, what does this mean? We really don't know. And surrounding the throne of God. So there is a proximity between Sidrat al-Muntaha and the throne of God. Now, again, if you don't understand what this means, you really shouldn't really you shouldn't un fully understand what this means because it's very elusive, it's very mysterious, it's ambiguous. Fatajalla, Imam al Baqir salam says, Fatajalla li Muhammadin Nurul Jabbar. So when the Prophet goes beyond this boundary, there is a tajalli, there is you know a manifestation of God. A disclosure. So the Prophet is enshrouded in light. The hujub are being removed. So the Prophet fixed his gaze on this powerful light and his limbs began to tremble. It was a very powerful experience something that no created being has ever endured then the imam says فَشَدَّ اللَّهُ لِمُحَمَّدٍ قَلْبَهُ وَقَوَّى لَهُ بَصَرًا the prophet fortif Allah fortified he strengthened the heart of the prophet and he strengthened his vision so you see even the prophet needs this divine assistance to experience this inner witnessing you know and this is why imam al-baqir alayhi salam he says there are certain levels of faith that can only be reached through dua don't think that you're able to go high and ascend the ladder of spirituality through your efforts allah has to intervene allah has to make it easier for you to come close to him so allah fortifies the heart and the sight, the vision of the Prophet, Hatta Ra'a Min Ayat Rabbihi Ma Ra'a. And then the Prophet was able to see the signs that he was able to see. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next verse, al Basar wa ma taga. The gaze did not swerve, nor did it transgress. Now, some of the commentators have said that this verse means that the Prophet's gaze did not swerve from the wonders being revealed to him. You know, sometimes, you know, you may be looking at something that's very beautiful, but you may, you know, look from side to side. You may avert your gaze. But there are other times where you're looking at something that is so amazingly beautiful that you cannot turn your eye away from it. It is so captivating that the Prophet doesn't even shift his eyes from right to left. Completely enamored, completely captivated. And you know, brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes when I was reading this verse, it made me think about the way that we pray, the way that we perform our salah. Have you seen some people when they stand in salah? Now their bodies are not moving, but their eyes are doing what? A person walks by, he moves his eyes. Looking, now it doesn't break your salah, but this shows you that there is a lack of attention. There's a lack of hudur al-qalb. That your eye is shifting from side to side because of your lack of concentration. When the Prophet is experiencing this encounter when you truly experience god you don't turn your gaze towards anyone but him this is why when imam al-sajjad was in mecca he used to go inside of masjid al-haram at night you know people go home they leave he would stand near the Kaaba, and he would recite dua and he would cry and he would weep Ta'us al-Yamani one of the contemporaries one of his companions he says I entered into Masjid al-Haram one night 
and it was completely dark, but I heard a man supplicating to his Lord, weeping profusely. And I was enjoying the dua of this man who was confessing his shortcomings and his weakness before Allah. So I had a lantern and I wanted to see who is this man who is supplicating to Allah with such beautiful words, with, with such profound words. He says, I came close and I saw that, that it was Ali ibn Hussein, Zayn al Abidin. Ba'us al Yamani, he says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, this is you who's crying, who's weeping, who's begging Allah for his mercy. Your, your father is Imam al Hussein, your grandfather is Amir al Mu'mineen, your great grandfather is Rasulullah. Your great-grandmother is Khadija, Sayyida Fatima Anisam. You come from the most noble family. You have the blood of Rasulullah running in your veins. You don't have to worry. You don't need to weep. The Imam السلام, he says, Man an an Rabbi? Who is this person who's talking to me and distracting me from my Lord? You see, when you witness the beauty of God, everything else, you see it as a distraction. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, do not speak to me about my forefathers. Do not speak to me about what family I come from. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ خَلَقَ ال... خَلَقَ النَّارَ لِمَنْ عَصَاهُ وَلَوْ كَانَ سَيِّدًا قُرَشِيًا Allah has created Hellfire for the one who's disobedient to him, even if he's from the same tribe as the Prophet, even if he's from the same family as the Prophet. And Allah has created Jannah, He has created paradise for the one who is obedient to him, even if he is a slave from Ethiopia, meaning even if. He doesn't have any status in society, doesn't matter. Because the honor of a person in Akhirah depends on their obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point being here is that the Prophet, he's seeing things that are so wondrous that he doesn't avert his eyes. Nor does it did it transgress. Ma zagh al basaru, the gaze did not swerve, nor did it transgress. Nor did it transgress. Some have said that it means that Rasulullah did not seek anything beyond what was disclosed to him. And this is a very high level of spirituality. That you have so much control over your nafs, that you have control even over the movement of your eyes. That you don't even move your eyes in a way that is not pleasing to Allah. You don't even move your eye in a way that may incur, incur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's displeasure. And furthermore, you do not seek anything beyond what Allah has given you. And this comes even with knowledge. The Prophet doesn't say, oh, show me more. If Allah chooses, Allah shows me what he sees is fit for me to see. Meaning he doesn't seek beyond what Allah decides to show him. Even his curiosity is tamed and is under the jurisdiction of his intellect. He doesn't seek beyond what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has deemed for him appropriate to see. لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى And indeed, certainly he saw um, from among the signs from his Lord. Now, you know, time doesn't allow us, you know, it's 8 o'clock right now. But this reference to some of the signs of his Lord, some have said that it's, it includes everything. From the Prophet's journey from Mecca to Masjid al-Aqsa, because the Prophet, even in this night journey, 
he stops in Medina, he prays in Medina, and Jibra'i takes him to different places and he prays out of reverence for the sanctity of those places. When Rasulullah reaches Masjid al-Aqsa, he's received by the souls of past prophets and he prays jama'a, he leads the anbiya in congregational prayer. These are all part of the ayat. And from Masjid al-Aqsa, the Prophet ventures into an ascension through the different heavens. And in each of the heavens, the Prophet meets other Prophets. He meets Malaika. He meets Malakul Maut. He meets the keepers of Hellfire, the, keep, the, the, the keepers of Paradise. Rasulullah sees Paradise. He sees the Hellfire. So there are many narrations that speak about the Mi'raj. And as a final comment, brothers and sisters, many of the ahadith, you know the hadith Qudsi that we have, al-ahadith al-Qudsiya, where the Prophet relays to us what God says without Jibra'il as a medium for that communication. Commentators, they say that many of these ahadith Qudsiya are from Mi'raj, where the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks directly to the Prophet, where he reaches that, pl that place of maximum nearness to God, Allah shares these pearls of wisdom with the Prophet. And perhaps the hadith where Allah says to the Prophet, Ya Ahmad, lawlaak lama khalaqtul aflaak. O Ahmad, meaning which is one of the names of the Prophet, if it was not for you, I would not have created the universe, creation. And if it was not for Ali, I would not have created you because there was there would be no one to continue your legacy, to preserve your message. And if it was not for Fatima, I would, I would have not created either of you. Perhaps these ahadith where Allah speaks directly to the Prophet, these ahadith were given to him during the Mi'raj, when he was in that place beyond Sidratul Muntaha, where it was only him and his Lord, and there was no intermediary in that communication. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.